So once upon a time, there was a little mouse, and she lived in the woods with all the other mice, and she spent her days exploring, looking for food, collecting food, storing food, all the things that little mice do. But sometimes, way off in the distance, she heard a roaring. She asked the other mice if they knew what this roaring was, and they looked at her like kind of funny and said, there is no roaring. I don't know what you hear. Something's wrong with you. But she kept hearing it. And finally, she decided she needed to go find out what it was. So she got up her courage, and she left the mouse woods, and she went down the forest path. She went down this forest path farther than she'd ever gone. She didn't know what to find. She, didn't know, she was afraid but she kept going. Pretty soon she met Raccoon. Raccoon said, little mouse, what are you doing so far away from the mouse woods? She said, well, I hear this sound, I hear this roaring, and I don't know what it is. The Raccoon said, oh, little mouse, you hear the river. Let me take you to the river. So they walk down the path, Little Mouse was really grateful that she had the raccoon with her, guiding her. And when they got to the river, she was amazed. She couldn't see across it. It was so big. And the power of all of that water just flowing was like, like nothing she could have possibly imagined. Raccoon needed to leave, and so he took her over to the side of the, um, the, side of the river and intru introduced her to a frog over at the edge um, near some willows where it was a little calmer. The little mouse sat there and this frog got to live on this river. How amazing was that? But the frog said, you know, little mouse, I've got something else to show you. Do you want to see something even more amazing? And the little mouse said, yeah, yes. And so the frog says, crouch down just as low as you can, and then spring up as high as you can. And when you get up to the top, look way off in the distance, and then tell me what you see. And so Little Mouse crouches way down as low as she can, and then springs up as high as she can, looks way off in the distance, and falls down kerplunk in the water. And she bursts out of the water, and she screams, what did you do that for? I'm all wet, what did you make me do that for? The frog said, just a minute, are you okay? She said, yeah, don't let your fear and anger blind you. What did you see? She said, well, I saw these really amazing shapes way, way off in the distance. And the frog says, you saw the mountains. And not only did you see the mountains, you have a new name. You're no longer Little Mouse. You're now Jumping Mouse. So Jumping Mouse decides it's time to go back home. She's got a lot to think about. Frog tells her just to keep the sound of that rushing water at her back, and she'll be able to get back to the Mouse Woods. So she goes back to the Mouse Woods. But when she gets back there, she tries to tell all the other mice about this river, and they've never seen such a thing, and they know it can't possibly exist. And besides that, she's soaking wet, and since it hasn't rained recently, they know there weren't any puddles where she could have fallen in and gotten wet, so they decide she must have gotten taken into the mouth of some wild animal who spit her out because she was poisoned, and clearly if she's poisoned to a wild animal, she's poisoned to the mice too, and they really want nothing to do with her. We're going to leave Little Mouse at this point. And if you want to hear more of the story of Jumping Mouse, you can find the whole story in a book called Seven Arrows. But I want to take that story, and I would take it over to my professional field, which is the field of international nutrition. And I want to talk about some of the times that we're like those mice, saying, we can't see that, there's no river, we know, nothing like that. So the first story I want to talk about are what are called traditional food systems. When we really think about what a traditional food system is, it's a food system where all of the food 
is coming from the local area. When Western civilization butts against a traditional food system, they don't know what that is. They, historically, we couldn't see it. We could not see the amazing diversity of both plants and animals that people were eating. In a traditional food system, people are using dozens of plants, dozens of animals. And our Western civilization doesn't know that many different kinds of foods. And so when we butt against it, we don't see it. One of the first things that happens with the traditional food system when it runs into the Western civilization is the, loss of the, the diversity of the diet goes way down. Eventually, the market system comes in and a little more diversity comes back. We're in a little bit more diverse place, but we're still not back to those dozens of plants and animals that come right from our local area. People today are thinking about what a local food system would look like. And are we ready to imagine, to go back and think about the things we couldn't recognize when we ran into them before, and to think about what we could learn from them? The other example I want to give you is the example of sugar. Sugar, we have an innate, uh, an innate preference for sweetness. Babies turn towards it. Um, bacteria move towards it. And throughout history, people have liked that sweetness. And, but it's always been a scarce food. And it's only been in the last 150 years that we really developed the technology, first, to purify it, and secondly, to purify it in large quantities. In, um, in 1918, Herbert Hoover said that sugar is the sort of binding material around which our cuisine largely revolves. And that was true in 1918, and it's true today. What we didn't know as nutritionists was that when we took that sugar out of the food matrix in which it had, it had evolved, that it would have a completely different physiological effect. When we made it pure, it would do something different. We couldn't imagine that. And so we thought sugar was wonderful, and what we're starting to find out now, with time, is that it does things differently. It has different biological effects. We're aware that, that sugar can be addictive, that there's issues of whether it's, it's, it's actually contributing to cholesterol, things we didn't know. So I want to go back now to that story of Jumping Mouse. And I want to ask how we, both professionally and as individuals, walk with the knowledge that there are rivers out there that we cannot imagine. How do we make decisions about how we live our lives to walk with uncertainty, to know that it is there, to know that there are things we cannot imagine? One of the, the sort of cutting edge of nutrition today is around the issue of all of the bacteria that we are hosts to. There are more bacteria in our body than there are cells. And what we're finding is somehow that bacteria is playing a huge role in nutrition. And we didn't know this 10 years ago. So in the field of nutrition and in much of our lives, being aware of what we don't know even if we can't name what it is, being aware that we don't know carries an amazing power of walking with humility in a way that might change how we move forward in this earth. I want to end with an excerpt from a poem from Little Gidding, which is part of the Four Quartets by T.S. Eliot. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Through the unknown remembered gate, where the last of Earth left to discover is that which was at the beginning. Thank you. <laughs>